Well, thank you all so much for coming out to see me talk about my weird little hobby. I think, um, I think the way that I, uh, the way that I got roped into this is I keep posting stuff like this on uh, Facebook, and but this is my wife and I, uh, uh, as Coraline and YB. Nobody in here knows who that is. I've, I found out that I'm the only, we're the only adults that watch that movie apparently. But, um, but um, kind of how I got started in all this, uh, maybe like some of you, I started, I've always been a tinker. I've always liked technology. My background, I'm a software engineer. So um, I'm sort of already bent that way, that weird way that you sort of like this terrible, you know, the, the problem solving at this ridiculous level. Um, but, uh, but I didn't really have a focus for it, you know, so I bought a bunch of Arduinos and I, I lit every type of LED that I could find, you know, powered up. But they were just sort of this unfocused uh, thing where I was kind of, you know, I was enjoying the daylights out of it, but it, you know, it was just sort of, I mean, they were like Lego pieces around the house. I'd step on it, they, I would buy one every time something different would come out and I'd play around with it. And, um, but then we moved, when we moved out to East Nashville, about 10 years ago, we had been there for about 20 minutes, and one of our, one of our neighb the neighbors were really engaged, and they were, they were all in our business in like 10 minutes, and they were talking about Halloween. It was just before Halloween, and they were really ominous about it. They were like, Halloween is serious business around here. Like, I don't know what you think you got into, but you don't know what you're doing, and let us break it down for you. And it was weird. It was really strange. I mean, and I'm not kidding. They were really serious about it. And it turns out, uh, on a slow year, we get 300 kids in our neighborhood. Um, I, we've counted as many as 500. And it's, uh, and it's just a, I mean, I was never really into Halloween, to be honest. That was just kind of a thing we had where we lived before. It was kind of a, you know, we didn't get a lot of kids coming around. And so we kind of got in the habit of turning out the lights and going to the back room and watching a movie, right? And then we got here, and it was just this crazy thing. And it was, uh, uh, and so we started doing, you know, we started doing some decorations and stuff, and it's, the lights started to go off. Like, here's a place to focus some of that, uh, some of that energy. And so I started playing around with, with some things. And the first thing I did, which I am so sad to tell you I have lost the, uh, the video of, was a, um, a set of singing pumpkins. And that was an Arduino with uh, really simple and, and the technique that I'm going to show you a little bit later. And, uh, but it, it couldn't be more simple. It was really just like <coughs> hand puppets that had servos on them, really very simple. Um, but that's, that's kind of how I got started. That's how all this happened. And, so, and it's also an excuse for why it's not uh, more elaborate than it is. But I'll tell you some tricks that I have, um, that I have learned. That, that, and that's really the bottom line up front here is I'm going to show you some motors, and I'm going to show you some, you know, some things to connect them up, and I'm going to show you some techniques. But the real thing that you ought to take away from here is simple is better. And, not, um, and that's not a warning to beginners. That's, that's good advice for beginners, but it's really a warning to as you begin to get advanced. You're going to start to want to add more things and do more motion and things like that. And that is, it just doesn't produce the best results. It's not so much, I mean, keeping it simple is good because less to break, especially as your displays get more elaborate. But um, that's the one thing that I think I could save you from because I went, I went uh, elaborate and complex fast. And I'm going to show you. I, th I think I may have a, yeah, I've got an example in here that we're going to see of a uh, six degree of freedom platform for a neck, you know, that could have been two uh, axes. It's just unbelievably complex and uh, ended up not, not working so great, but it was, a, it was a hard lesson in probably hundreds of hours of work that, you know, was, could, have, could have been two servos, right? So anyway, that's, that's the big thing. I've already stolen my own thunder of my own uh, slides. All right, we're off to a raging start. Okay, so here's a few. Here's a, a sample of some of the stuff that I've that I've worked on. I'm going to show some video of some of these, but at the far left is the snowman. That's that's the best video I have of it, even though I'm, I, I, it's cringeworthy as far as I'm concerned. Um, this is this year's uh, the cauldron creeper here, and to talk about simplicity, that the only microcontroller in this uh, in this at all is really for the flame effects underneath the, underneath the cauldron there. Everything else is simple DC motors, and I think it's one of the most organic and best looking effects that I've done. Um, this skull was actually a candidate to go on top of that, and I ended up getting rid of the complexity of this. 
and it really was pretty nice. Um, this is one of my favorite effects. It's very simple, but it's really e effective. You might have seen, uh, if, you're, if you're a Halloween nut like I am, you'll see lots of little projects that parents do with their kids. One of them is uh, you can take toilet, toilet paper rolls and you can cut eye shapes out of them and put a glow stick inside of them and hang them in the bushes. It's brilliant. It's really good. It makes a nice effect. But I was like, well, how can I add a microcontroller to this? And so we 3D printed those shapes and made little boxes. And inside those boxes, and we put a little bit of uh, silk between those so that you diffuse the light a little bit. And so just hot glue some LEDs in there. These are addressable LEDs like you get at uh, Adafruit or wherever. And the only, in just a simple animation where they blink on and off like the Scooby-Doo eyes, you know, uh, in a cave. Dead simple and hidden in the dark. Wonderful effect. Really simple, really powerful, and, and subtle, nuanced. You know, when you first start doing this, your explosions and uh, lights and everything <laughs> like that. And then so, <clears throat> so subtle is the thing that I have learned that I actually wanted to do, even though it's not explosions. So I'm repeating myself here, but when I first started out, I, I wanted to, I mean, the big thrill for me is when someone, uh, when someone argues with me that I made something. They're like, no, you didn't make that. And that just, oh, it's the <laughs> best thing ever. I just love that. And so that's what I was out to do, to, you know, to do some, some things like that where, you know, it's, it's totally self-serving. I mean, but this is what I've learned. Um, the main thing and is, and again, I can't stress this enough, it's not just for the beginners. It's actually more for as you become more advanced, you're going to keep adding more dimensions to what you're doing, and you're just going to be disappointed. Plus, you start to learn things like if you build something and it's going to move for 48 hours, it's going to rip itself to pieces. And so really, craftsmanship about what you're constructing around these things is really where you're going to spend your time. So the brains are, you know, that's interesting, and that's what we're all, that's kind of what got me started on the path, but I've really become, you know, I've really, I'm really becoming, like, really interested in materials. Um, what holds up, you know, what um, the cauldron creeper that you saw there spent the winter in uh, storage, and some ugly things happened to it. <laughs> so that's why it's not here. But anyway, uh, so I, I assume we have kind of a range of, of experience levels here. So I imagine we've got some people that are just sort of starting out all the way to, well, people who make parts for old, um, for old uh, synthesizers, which is, which, well, that's, that's very cool. Um, so these are kind of like the Lego parts. You know, when you want to you start, uh, these are kind of the Lego parts. And there's a few things you should know about. If you don't know much about motors, um, I don't either. I know enough to tell you how to get started. And then in no time, you'll know more than I do. But this is kind of where you'll, a good place to start. <clears throat> and you might think you're going to know, you probably know about servos and things like that. And we'll talk about those. But don't uh, forget about the lowly DC motor. And they go anywhere from little tiny toy sizes that can run straight from an Arduino, although uh, probably, not, probably not a good idea most of the time. But you can, uh, you can run them that way. They're fairly simple to deal with. And they, they come in two flavors, brushed and brushless. In the beginning, I'd start with uh, brushed. Brushless uh, is a little bit different animal. They're still fairly inexpensive, but they require a little more circuitry to drive. Not hard, either one of them. You'll find a billion uh, examples of how to do that, um, uh, to do that on there. But the real, you know, so they're, they're inexpensive. You can find them in every shape and size and all, di all different, um, for all different purposes. They're relatively simple to drive. You'll find tons of examples. But the, the main thing for our purposes is they don't provide feedback on their own. And what I mean by feedback is, the motors themselves don't really know anything. They're, they're, just, they're just dumb motors. They just spin, right? So you put power to them, they spin. You take power away, they stop. It's as simple as that. Now, there are some tricks you can do with different motor drivers. You can use uh, PWM signals to sort of, you know, to change the speed a little bit. But it's pretty, it's pretty crude. That doesn't mean you can't have feedback. You can use things like limit switches. So you could, you could spin a, a belt and move a part you know, down a track. And then when it hits a limit switch, you know it, you know it hit there so, that, so you can cut the power to the motor. But you have to build that part yourself. So that's probably the main thing here. So just sort of put that in your mind. Like for this Lego piece, if you're going to use something, the motor itself isn't going to tell you anything about what's going on with the motor. So there are other solutions if you need, if you need more feedback. This is probably. Um, 
this is a great place to start too, servos. If any of you have done RC stuff, you know all about servos. Servos are, um, servos are great for moving control surfaces on remote control airplanes or moving steering on RC cars. And so they're very precise. You can tell them exactly where in their span of motion that you, you want them to go. So you can say, you know, sort of pseudo code, go to position zero, go to position all the way, and go somewhere in the middle, and then everywhere in between. <coughs> all kinds of different sizes. They start really inexpensively, usually made from plastic parts. They have plastic gears. There's really, um, they really are just DC motors, but they got a few extra parts in there. There's gearing to um, change some of the speed of the motor into torque. And depending on what you're trying to do and how torquey you need it to be, there's all different configurations for that. Um, there's a control board in the bottom that, that takes some simple, uh, interprets some simple commands and tells it what to do. And there's a potentiometer in there that tells, tells that circuit board where it is in its, in its range of travel. So you send it a set of um, sort of a frequency of pulses, and usually it's between, I think, one millisecond and two milliseconds. If it's two millisecond pulses, it's all the way one way. If it's one millisecond pulses, it's all the way the other way. On a standard servo, it's usually about 90 degrees. And that may seem pretty limiting, but if you think about, if you see this uh, circular piece of plastic on top, that's a servo horn. They come in all different shapes and sizes depending on what you're trying to do. But typically, the way these were developed, I assume, for the RC industry, they would often drive, so, so if you think of these little holes, there's push rods in there. So a piece of wire that's hooked in there that just pushes and pulls a surface. And if it's, if it's going in both directions, I could have one push rod going in one direction, one going the other, and it's, it's pushing two different services, sur uh, surfaces with one motion. So there's a couple different ways to use it. But this, is, this is really handy. I mean, for, a, for like a mouth, anything that's back and forth, like a mouth or eyes that go back and forth, the entire, all of the parts of this skull that you're going to see later, those are all, everything is driven by a server in there. There's no other type of motor in there. They can be loud. You'll hear that. Um, what else? What else? Pretty easy to control. They're not really easy to control if you had to sit down and write that code yourself, but they're so ubiquitous that I can't imagine there's a platform out there that doesn't have a library to drive them. So very simple. Certainly one of the like example programs, and I think it I'm certain that it comes with Arduino. The other one that, that is probably not, this isn't probably one you'd go to right away, but a stepper motor is has some of the same design goals as the servo, but it works a little bit differently. It knows some things about how it's moving, but it doesn't, like a, ser a servo knows where it is at any given time. A stepper motor doesn't really know where it is at any given time, but it can move a very precise amount. So you, you send it a set of pulses, and depending on the make and design of the stepper motor, it will move a very precise uh, amount around its rotation, but it, but it can co uh, rotate continuously. This is what you see in printers. This is what you see in um, CNC machines, uh, 3D printers, of course. And you'll hear that sound. You know, when you hear a, a 3D printer, that's definitely, you know, you can tell a stepper motor. And I think there's a whole industry around making stepper motors quiet. I have a set of uh, little, little bumpers that go on this to help quiet down a 3D printer, that sort of stuff. Probably not the first thing you, you're going to, but if you think about something where you need very precise movement, Typically, for props and things like, like that, you don't need that. But when you need to go exactly to a position, now one thing that can happen with stepper motors is, because it doesn't know exactly where it is, if for some reason it skips a step, it won't know that. And neither will your code, because there's no feedback. So that's where you get, you know, you'll, you'll see the effects of that. 3D printers will suffer that. If they go too fast, they can, they can skip a step. And then you get, you get this weird shape that starts to drift off to one side. Anyway, that's not what we're talking about. <coughs> But these are, just, these are just some things to sort of keep in your head. You, you know, just, these are some of the Lego pieces that you have to choose from when you're, when you're doing it. I would certainly start with some of the things we started with. A DC motor can be really powerful, and it's simple, less things to go wrong. A simple, um, and then all this, you know, for whatever your feedback is, all your sensors that you're already probably using for some of your projects, those are all available to you. And here's an honorable mention. Um, I had one of these to bring in here, and of course I left it. But uh, this is really, uh, this is just a DC motor, probably. There's different configurations. But this, this just converts that rotational motion into linear motion. So this is what you need when you want to open, say, the lid of a coffin, perhaps. Um, and then how much money you spend on this sort of depends on what, what you're after. So 
uh, the price of these tend to go up depending on how much weight they can handle and how quickly they can move that weight. Um, but um, another good thing to note, and there's versions of this from very tiny to all, and they come in all kinds of different things. They tend to be expensive, so a lot of my coffins stay closed. <laughs> Let's see. And then just, just as a teaser for, you know, because you're going to skip totally past my um, advice about going simple, and so if you're going to go all out, you might as well go to pneumatics and hydraulics and... Uh, there's muscle wire, if you've never, that's a weird little thing. It's like a, it's a particular type of wire. When you give it, put electrical uh, current through it, it, it sort of contracts and bends a bit like a muscle. Um, not very strong. There's some other things like that, that. So there's all kinds of weird things to do. You may be surprised, though. Pneumatics are not, as in, are not quite as, they're not as far out of reach as you might think. There's a couple of uh, good places. If you, if you want to do Halloween props, they got kind of a whole starter kit so you can you know, you can start blowing yourself up for, uh, for, for not, too, not too bad. So here's a couple of things, and we'll get to, I'll quickly try to get to all the stuff that, that you, want, you want to see. But, um, but here's a couple of things I would suggest. Work from the prop back. I'm going to hopefully show some examples of, of why you'd want to do that. But um, you already probably know the basics of, of a microcontroller, you're going to get that right, and that's software. It's very, you know, you, you decide it's wrong, you just erase it and start over. If you spend hours on a paper mache project that you need to move, or it, you know, that's really where you want to spend your time. So get that. So start with getting the look right. Start thinking about the motion of it. Keep it simple. Think about, you know, so think puppet first, right? Control it any any way you can. Give a little thought to where some of the mechanics are going to go, maybe even test them, but really focus on that first and then work your way back. So if you could control it with something besides the complexity of a microcontroller to start with, it's definitely going to work with the microcontroller, right? So, so I know that's hard because, you, you know, at least it was for me. I was like, okay, I'm going I'm to have, have a symphony of props, and they're all going to sing at the same time. And then I realized that was going to take seven years in my garage, you know. So... Um, so it's really good to go through that to go through that process, but I really think that's uh, that's really important. And if you're after what I'm after, which is trying to get people to think that you're better than you are, um, the subtlety of something, you know, working on the the, the look and feel of it, and, and lighting, and how the, where the sound's going to be, and things like that. I mean, if you have a great prop and it's in too much light, and you can see all the, you know, really thinking about just the whole presentation, you can start with that and then work your way back to the mechanics. And I really recommend doing that and playing around with the materials and playing around with uh, cardboard versions that you can throw away and get some of that. Because that's really where the look is going to be going to be great. When you start to add servos and things to it, it's going to become less organic. It's going to start to move like a robot because it's a motor, right? So the more, you can, the more life you can breathe into it before you start introducing a bunch of mechanical parts, the better. And here's my example of what I think is a, so can anyone tell me what they think they see here? Uh, uh, can, and, and what else? A beautiful brick. You know what it is, be quiet. <coughs> a fence, right? Um, what do you think that fence is made out of? Iron. Iron, so like wrought iron and the pillars. So this is made of foam, it's made of quarter inch plywood, and you could walk over to it and push it over with just one hand. The, the, the wrought iron is made from PVC with little plastic cappers, the, um, and you can't really see it here, but, the, but there's lathing, and the fence is held to the, um, to the, to the post by zip ties. It, and it's nailed into the ground. I didn't put the bike there. This was after Halloween. We had left this up because my niece and nephew were coming over to see it, and they were having a chili cook-off next door. And one of the participants at the chili cook-off <coughs> chained their bike. This is locked. <laughs> it is the greatest compliment anyone has ever paid to me, and I guarantee you there's not a single microcontroller in any of that. But, but you put this with a couple of props, and 
this actually took, we spent so, oh my God, I thought this was going to be easy. We spent so much time on this fence. The effect was really, really nice though. And I included this picture because the other thing about that picture is, had they, as they were walking into my neighbor's house, had they looked over their shoulder and turned around, they would have seen that all those posts were three-sided boxes. They could have been made of cardboard. But that's how it came together. Um, we can talk all day. Like, I could go on and on about um, the techniques for finishing stuff like this, but so can the internet. You can find all that stuff. But feel free to ask those questions if you like. But that's the point. That's by far, my happiest moment was, um, I'll tell you one other story about that, which I can't post on the internet because it would be mean. But my neighbor, who actually the one who's having the chili cook-up, she's an interior designer. She has a beautiful sense of style. She's very, she's very stylish, good sense of design, all that sort of stuff. And her mother was there for the chili cook-off. And she took her aside, you know, this was a couple days after Halloween, and she said, you need to talk to your neighbors. That fence is hideous. <laughs> She told me that story, and I was like, God, it just keeps getting better. I mean, no, this is the last thing I thought people would notice, but it just, it just matters so much. I mean, the fact that, um, I mean, bricks were falling off of it. I, I thought there were so many things, you know, I look at these things, and I can see every little thing that's wrong with it, but people walk past them, and they're delighted by them, or they don't even know that they're there, which is amazing to me. So, so, uh, so there's a couple things. Um, it's actually kind of a monster mud, which is a... It's an industry term in us amateur um, Halloween folks, but uh, there's a couple of recipes out there for it. But it's, uh, uh, in that case, I've done it a couple ways, but it's, it's typically like, um, like uh, pla you know, plaster, for, uh, not flat, mud, the dry, drywall mud with some paint for the right colors. In this case, it was something called dry lock, which is similar, but it's used to seal basements. And the cool thing about it is it's got a little bit of sand in it, so it came with texture. So I made this big, thick thing with, with that, some, some Portland cement, and a bit of paint. And then we sprayed it on with the same tool you used to spray popcorn ceilings on the ceiling. So that's the other thing about like any excuse to buy a tool that I will never, ever need again. Yeah. Well, this was, still, this was still expensive, but I think it might be a good option for you. And, and it actually, because of the Portland cement, um, except for, I used, there were things I would do different because these did fall apart, uh, but, the, but not because of that. The, the coating was waterproof, and it felt like, I mean, it, like people would touch it, and it felt great. We, we, we had some other issues. There were some, there were some you know, choice of adhesive, but, you know, live and learn. What's, what's a thousand dollars spent on a fence, anyway? <laughs> So, uh, so uh, this, is a, this is a video here, so I'll give you a little shot of this if I can operate my... Now, this was an early shot, and of course it's in full light. Um, but this is dead simple, and most of the work... Um, I hope you think that's a pretty convincing uh, movement there. Um, and if you notice... So this, this is me. I'm going to try not to do this the whole time, because I just cringe at every little thing. But you see how... You see down here in the... In the fire, there's like a little flash of blue every once in a while. If you think that's cool, fantastic. That was intentional. But if you don't, it's because I stepped on it because this was 2 in the morning, and I had put off doing this until the night before Halloween. And so I sort of crushed them, and they, you know. But, um, but so um, I don't know if anyone can guess how this is working, but this is, a, this is a very simple PVC frame. And if you'll notice that as it's moving, uh, it's moving really predictably for the most part, but then you'll notice you'll notice this sort of satisfying little sway, you know, like like some of the, you know, nothing in here is really like precise, and so you get these little bumps, little tiny bumps, and just little sway here and there. I just love this. It couldn't be simpler, but I just, I could just, I just sat down and just stared at it forever, and in the dark, and it kind of creeped me out, because it was sort of, uh, <laughs> um, but, so, what, what, what's in the bottom of this? So, where do you think the motion is coming from? Where's the motor? Yeah, so you might have seen this one, but, um, but this arm is rigid, so it's essentially holding that stick in, in one place. So, that's kind of the pivot point. This other arm is just floppy. It's just loosey-goosey. Like all it's doing is, 
it's zip tied to that thing and the motion is all happening. But isn't that amazing how good that looks? Could not be simpler. I have I learned it the hard way, but this is one of my favorite effects, and it doesn't do anything. It just sits there. I, I, several people thought it was a person in the costume. Really? Ab absolutely. Which? <laughs> well, there were. Yeah. I mean, now you add lighting. You add. I mean, and then my wife dressed it, and then it looked good, right? I dressed it because yeah. Um, the other. So there's one other motor, and see if you could notice this. But there's one other motor on here that's that's not in the cauldron. I'm learning to operate my computer. See if you can see if you can spot it. No, no, that's just flopping around. But it looks good, doesn't? Close. It's on the neck. So so it's just this. So that's a down in here is a windshield wiper motor. And that's my that's my best advice to you. Buy windshield wiper motors like crazy. They're fantastic. They're DC motors. They, they usually have two voltage settings, but any 12 volt source, so a car battery or any 12 volt uh, wall wart, you know, that has a little bit of juice in it. But the cool thing is you can put five volts on it and it slows way down, but it's still nice and torquey. So it can handle a bit of weight, it can handle a bit of mass, but you get this really nice slow movement. You can go fast if you need to, you just bump up the voltage. Behind that, um, is a reindeer head motor. So those, those hideous wire, white wire reindeer that come out every, or used to, I guess when I was a kid. Um, but you can buy those, and they're, they're um, dead cheap, and they're nice and slow. They can't take a lot of weight, but they're good for that slow movement. So it's just a tiny, tiny little bit of raising the head and bringing it back down. And because they're totally separate, they're not talking to each other. Like if I had put a micro, they would, they would move in perfect time with you. Well, these are two different, totally separate loops. So sometimes, you know, I'm mo moving forward and heads up. So it's, I mean, it's simple, but I just love it. I think it's, I think it's fantastic. And so if you haven't got it, I'm trying to impress upon you. Leave the microcontroller out until you have to have it. you have a rough cost materials for that? Um, yes, but I will never tell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple other things. The, the cauldron is made from... Uh, Great stuff. That's a that's just a planter, a plastic planter from uh, from Home Depot. Uh, if you're again, I, I can get into the fabrication of this stuff. I got pictures. I got whatever you would like to know. About, but um, but great stuff is actually great stuff. This stuff uh, around the bottom is just great stuff. And um, you'd be amazed. You would think it would be opaque, but it actually is quite translucent, and it doesn't take a lot of LEDs. And so those LEDs that you know, that wrap of LEDs, I've got one strip of uh, NeoPixels inside for the green and then a bunch down there with a simple program to do um, a nice fire effect. And, and, when the, uh, and in the dark out front, it really looked... It really well, never, never do, you know, this is what I'm trying to teach you, not what I do, which is never do anything the easy way. Um, I, I probably could have, but I was worried that they would be too, they wouldn't diffuse enough, so I wanted them away a bit. So when I sprayed it all together, I, I put some tubing to create a void, put plastic over that, and just sprayed it all over it, so it made a little bit of a cavity, and then I put them in there. Probably not necessary, but I, it, if it you know, made me feel better in case it didn't work, but um, it'd be worth a try to just spray it all over it. I'm sure it would work fine. Another very simple effect. Sorry for the noise. That's awesome. You should sell that. Someone offered to buy it. And when I came up with the number that it actually cost me, in, uh, they said, no, thank you. Um, the, this is a Walmart skeleton that just had nice movement. Um, the arms were floppy. Now they're all making them where they can stay posed, which is a problem for stuff like this. Um, but I think you probably saw it. So that's another wiper motor. Uh, it, I was testing what was the right voltage to get the speed I wanted and screwed the two hands into the tree. So uh, I'm actually using a, 
this, this didn't run off a of battery. I, I, I eventually built, so the only real circuitry I had in there was a little circuit to, to bump the voltage down from mains. And so I had, because I had a few of these things out there, so I built a couple of circuits to knock the, knock the voltage down to what I wanted. I was using a bench power supply for that, but none of that is, you, you can do it. You know, if you got the tools used, but there's plenty of ways to, to do it without like all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> all right, last, last one of the simple, the simple things, but I still think these are some of the best things I've had. This is a flying crank ghost, and that sound you hear, um, totally unintentional. It was just the fact of how it was put together, but isn't that awesome? And so then I was like trying to figure out how to, imp like, I would replace the strings or whatever else, and I'd be like, I, I can't lose that noise. It's uh, now it turns out that was the sound of the prop tearing itself to pieces. But um, <laughs> but this is a, this is called a flying crank ghost. I didn't come up with that name. Uh, this is sort of you know if you sort of dip your toe into the into the people that do Halloween displays like maniacs, it's a little it's a little creepy, and not for the reasons you think. I mean, it's like they're a, little, they're a little bit nuts, but they all have this, you know, so they'll name things after the first person they, can, they think did it. So there's an axe-worthy ghost. This is a flying crank ghost. Well, this is flying crank ghost because of how it's built, but there's a few of those things that who knows what the, what the history is around them. But this is, um, but you can see another uh, wiper motor up there. I mean, it's just so good. You get this nice, slow, torquey movement that can handle uh, a bit of weight. And it's just simple. So there's a bunch of uh, fishing swivels, some high, pa uh, high test fishing line that runs through three little pulleys on the end just, just to try and keep it from rubbing. And you get this, you know, it's predictable motion, but it's nicely organic, and it's a really great effect. By the way, if you take cheesecloth and you put white writ dye in it, it glows um, the whitewash, the writ whitewash. Um, it just it glows a beautiful eerie purple in uh, black light. Um, and there's some good paint for that too, but we got, that's how you got some of the glow. <coughs> the video didn't do a good, good, a good job in, in, the, in the display. It was really nice. That was actually quite cheap. That was a nice cheap uh, prop and it was, it was good. Okay. So then, so those are kind of the motion bits and hopefully that's a pretty good, I mean, it, I know that's not how do you do all these things, but a good way to place to get you started. You take whatever you're building, you make it move however you want, and then we'll, we'll, we'll sort of pull all of it together at the end, right? And of course, you're going to want sound in it. And <coughs> um, I've gone a little nuts on, on sound. I've got mixing boards, and I've got DMX stage lighting. Um, someone needs to help me. <laughs> you know, it's, it's getting a little nuts, but it's, you know, it's, 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 the point is, you don't, you don't have to do that, and I'm going to show a couple examples. Here's two really good effects that I like that I, think, that I think fit with the theme. The first one, again, just dead simple, but it's a great effect, and i got a video that you're going to see it here in a minute. But <coughs> it's got an audio in on one side, and on the back of it, which you can't see here, it's got a 110 uh, outlet on the back. So you plug yourself like a, a shop light is perfect, and then you run an audio track of a, like a storm through it, and then you adjust the squelch on it, so it'll, it's got a little bit of a filter, so if it's, you know, whatever, whatever looks best, and you just get this fantastic lightning effect. You, it's amazing how good it is, and it's just a, I mean, it could be, probably most of you could build something to do exactly that. Dead simple, but it's awesome. It's one of my favorite things. And then this, this is really, um, you, you can find a hundred variations on this, but I really like this for what we're talking about here. This is a, a simple soundboard. Um, you can probably guess most of what's going on here, but it's got some storage on board. You can store, um, you know, 15, 20 uh, MP3s uh, on there, and then it takes inputs into the pins. They've set it up with buttons here, but the important thing I want you to understand is this is a great way to start. You've got, you've got uh, <coughs> simple power. These speakers are actually quite loud. I'm going to show you, uh, I'm show you this, this thing exactly in just a minute, but remember, see, if you start, here's, I set this up with buttons, right? I'm, I'm moving something around and I'm pressing a button just to see how it all works. You can always replace those buttons with a, 
controller, right? So you've got the inputs, they're the same. So this is a great way to think about how to tackle uh, a problem. We'll talk, obviously what you want to see is how all that comes together in like a, you know, a complex way you can play it back. We'll get to that, but don't underestimate how powerful this can be and how, what, what a good effect it can be. So, <coughs> so <coughs> a couple things to think about. Here is 2016, and this is a lot of the effects you just saw, and this is kind of a walkthrough of the display. You see the lightning? That's that little box I was talking about. Um, the kids in my neighborhood are tougher than I am. Um, I don't, I don't know when to quit on the length of videos, I'm sorry. But we do, I do show that the, in the door there, that is, a, um, that is projector material and a backlit, it's a back projected onto it. And so here's, here's some of the stage lighting. Not necessary, probably not, <laughs> probably not even advisable. But I, th I think you do get to see the effect here. So these are just a couple of, I mean, those are, those are garden variety shop lights. Nothing special about them at all. Plug that, into that plug that into that little device and it's just a great effect. Anyway. Sure. Uh, I live on the 600 block of Fatherland, and it's a madhouse. Good luck getting over there. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, all right, so this is, this, is that same this is a variation on that same device. And, um, so I started posting some of this stuff, and all my, you know, some of my friends are like, hey, I've got an idea. Why don't you build it? <laughs> but I actually thought this was a really good idea. So he was going to, this is a good friend of mine. He's going to a party, and he's, he said, I know, I know what would be good. And this is back when Rick Rolling was still happening. Does everybody know what Rick Rolling is? Yeah, so, so it's where, you know, you'd send a link to somebody, you know, hey, check out this, you know, check out this report or whatever, and they end up going to the Rick Astley uh, uh, video. How's that song You're about to find out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so what he thought was, he says, he's like, you know, I want to get the jet, I want to get the overcoat like he's wearing in the video, and then all night long at the party, I'll just drive everybody crazy, but I want to be able to hit a button, and the jacket starts playing songs, so he's just going to be like a human Rick roll all night, right? <laughs> And so I was like, I think we can do that. And I was talking about the device that you just saw. And <clears throat> this'll, this'll, this is where I start to get to the cringeable part of my, uh, but this is the video I made from after I'd finished working on it. So here we go. All right, dude, this is the creepiest video I've ever made. I hope you appreciate it. Here we go. Grab the lapel about like this and <laughs> Turn it all the way around was jump right. the shark, is, see this on the which I think I've just done, right? So. <laughs> um, but anyway, simple, 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 and it was a big hit. I mean, you know, it was great. Plus, he's better at the moose than I am, so he was. He had a wig and the whole thing, so it was really, it was really pretty good. Uh, but <coughs> simple, simple, simple. Here is these are these are just like the buttons you saw before. These guys right here, but they're just really flat, so they were a good fit. We could sew it into the. Uh, and my wife is very good, uh, very good seamstress. So we um, th this was just the layout. We actually sewed this in. So even if he kind of opened the jacket, you didn't really see uh, what was going on in there, and. That was just like an iPhone camera, so the volume you heard from where I was, the, that was coming from the speakers with just, just some AA batteries. So it was a pretty good sound from yeah. not much. I think I used the, the same order, something similar to it. It's basically the same setup on my son's Alma Derby car one year. He wore 
Oh, that's a great idea. That's, it's a, it's a, and you know, doing stuff like that, like those are all the building blocks to put it all. I mean, these are all the same things, right? How you pull this stuff together. Those, like doing those things and thinking about the really simple things and then stitching them together is really, I think, the way to go. And it doesn't mean you're sacrificing. I mean, that was a lot of fun. That was tons of fun. All right, so this is what you, this is, this is what you came to see, and unfortunately, hopefully this works, because I lost a bunch of footage of some of this stuff, um, so this is now only on, only on YouTube, so, I, so we're going to YouTube to watch this one. I will also say, um, other than having listened to the sound of my own voice, which, is, which I'm sure you will agree is horrifying, um, uh, this was an entry to a contest with Servo City, um, so I was, I was doing this for a couple of reasons, but so some of what I'm talking about here is, is following the rules of the contest. So I am dorky, but not quite as bad as, as here. Um, this goes through the construction of things a little bit long, but I think it covers a lot of what you're going to care about. So um, just, just hang in there with me uh, till the end. Oops. I forgot the YouTube ones don't play. Like I would never do that. I would never. I was. I was trying to. I don't think it's. I don't think it's going to play nice. I've in, embedded it ever so precisely into my. Hello there. My name is Chris McPherson. I live in Nashville, Tennessee, and this is Brian, the snowman. It's my entry into the Servo City. God, he's such a dork. <laughs> No, but I'll tell you who it is in a minute. It's kind of cool. You kind of want to poke your eyes out about now, right? It's kind of, it's kind of too much. It won't let me stop. Well, at the end of that video, but I think we'll just 
just because it's too, it's too much. But um, so one thing about who's singing that, um, one of the reasons I don't have footage, and this will be particularly poetic because I work for BMI now. Um, <laughs> One of the reasons I don't, I don't have some of the footage is, is they were still sorting out some of the copyright stuff on YouTube. It's handled differently now, which I now know intimately. But, um, but I had made, so I had a set of the Singing Pumpkins that I think I mentioned earlier. And they had a repertoire of like 12 of my favorite Halloween songs. And I put it up on YouTube, but not in a public, um, just a place where I could, you know, direct people to it. And um, it got creamed by the, by a, um, I forget what it's called, but a, a copyright. Now it's, yeah, now, it's, now it's typically handled differently. But, um, and then I lost the original. So, uh, but that was, that, anyway, so I've, I'm stuck with, with this one. But the, the, the voice that you're hearing there is Brian Joyce. You, you may not know Brian. He was my neighbor at the time. He is now, this is so natural, this is so random, but he is, he is the front man for a band called King Leg, and he's touring with Dwight Yoakam right now, and no longer lives next door to me. But um, so you, you heard it here first, and uh, we'll get it out there so it'll embarrass him once he really hits it big. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, so a couple things about what you just saw. Um, I absolutely think it's horrible. I just can't stand it. There's so many things about it. This, is, this was my big lesson in complexity. So um, later in the video, I show, some, I show some of the mechanisms, but it's got a very complex neck me mechanism, which could do lots of things, but at showtime, once, once it got down to brass tacks, I had some sort of software problem. It was 2 in the morning. The deadline for the um, contest was coming. And so it's, it's got a few, I mean, there's a few nice movements in there, but none of it is what I wanted. The torso moved beautifully until I tried to film it. So, so I mean, it has very stiff, it was just so much about it. So, so just watching it, it just makes me cringe. And then later in the video, I'm showing all the, all the mechanics behind the torso that never moved in the first part. It just, uh. so, um, but, but, there's some, but there is some really good stuff in there about the synchronization of the movement. So, so the one thing that, that I think is good about that w was the, the syncing of the motion of the mouth to the, to the audio, which I'm sure is part of what you want to learn about how to do, right? I assume that's part of it. I mean, that's kind of what got me into it. Right? So let's see, what do I have up here? OK, so it, there's 100 ways to do this, but here's the basic idea of how it works. First, you need to get a song or an audio track or whatever it is that you want to do. It could be you could sync it to video, but you need an audio track or some sort of set of key, you know something you're going to play along with the motion of your of your prop that's going to look like it knows what's you know it's it's interacting. So, so you sort of the basic idea is you're going to record a state value for each of ch each of the channels that you care about. So, every motor that you have on this uh, device here, we've got. Horizontal movement of the eyes, vertical movement of the eyes, that's two channels. Um, yaw, pitch, and roll, three more channels, and then the mouth. So that's some number of channels that involves math. But um, so, for, so, if, uh, so you're going to take for each of those states, so you probably can already see where I'm going. You pick a, a regular interval. Uh, I have found that uh, 100 milliseconds is plenty enough for a pretty good motion. You can certainly go faster. but um, you know, different if you're trying to make an uh, animation that's made out of, you know, frames of, uh, of imagery. That's different. You need to fool the eye. But, but you're going to get a lot of natural motion because that's how motors move. So you don't, need, you don't necessarily need 100 points of data between in a one-second interval. Um, so 100 milliseconds is pretty good. Plus, that means that because, because in, you know, in microcontroller time, that's, that's ages. And so there's plenty of time to do other things if you want to do something. Uh, so that's, that's a good place to start. You can always tweak that. So uh, if we had six channels, we would, we would basically, conceptually, uh, we would have a frame of data that would be six bytes wide. It could be more data than that if you want to do something more complex. But I say keep it pretty simple. So, so what your controller is going to do, uh, you've got a source that's going to play back the audio. And it's going to send along at those, at those 10 uh, or 100 millisecond intervals. Uh, a frame for whatever time it currently is, right? You can do more elaborate timing schemes, but that's what I found works really well. It's really simple, great place to start. And so you're just taking those bytes of that frame. You're saying, OK, first byte, that's the position information for servo number one. 
number two is for number two, or however you're going to map it. And then you, you might not have a servo. Maybe you've got a light, and then you come up with, a, you know, you, you're, the, the controller is going to add meaning to whatever those, whatever those different bytes of data are. Does that generally make sense to everyone? Is anyone not following that? I feel like I stumbled all over it. But that's really the basic idea. There's a few ways to accomplish that. You can do like me, to, who always overkills everything. I wrote my own software for this. Um, I started with some software that I'm going to show you, uh, Vixen, soft, Vixen Lights. Uh, is an open source bit of software that's generally used to control light displays for Christmas time. And it can be pretty easily, at least the older version. Uh, then there's a new version, uh, there's a new piece of software that I just started using today because I tried to use Vixen Lights, which I've used for years, and they've upgraded it since the last time I did it, and I could not make any sense of it. So I found another one. It's not free like Vixen Lights is, and I'm pretty sure you can still do the things with the, with the new Vixen Lights. But anyway, there's a couple options for that. But it does that. It gives you a visual interface. You, you throw an audio file uh, on the screen, so you get the nice waveform. So you can, you can kind of get in there and really get, the, get it just like you want. Uh, the other thing that's nice about these, um, about these programs is they'll take the waveform and they'll they'll listen to it and, and sort of give you a you know sort of fill in a bunch of positions to start with based on uh, based on how loud the music is or whatever you know there's a few different ways for it to do for it to do it and so I'll show you a couple of those examples yeah so here's a visual representation of that. Um, exactly what I was just talking about. Now, um, now I'm going to be showing you exactly this. I put this together in a couple hours today, so it's not hard. It doesn't take too long. And so th you could do this if you're writing everything from scratch, but then um, this data could be whatever you want, right? So if you start to think about this, as long as you don't go overboard, you could expand and put whatever information you wanted there. So you could have something uh, more elaborate, if, you know, depending on what the device is that you're controlling. And in the example we're going to be looking at here, I am using, of course, the servos. Those are just, I mean, that's what we've been talking about. It's just a collection of motors wrapped in a plastic skull. And then it's going to a, a Pololu uh, Mini Maestro servo controller. This is a little bit different than if I, if I had written, I could have done it with an Arduino. This is a great little board. It's really easy to use, and that's in, there's a version of that that is the part that I'm giving away. Um, but it can do a couple other things that are really cool for animation. So if you think about if I'm controlling a, a servo, and we talked about this already, I can go about 90 degrees. So I could go all the way to zero, all the way to, in this case, if these are byte values, 255 would represent the two millisecond uh, pulse rate that I was talking about. So I've got those two values. And if I'm doing this in this sort of like very digital way, I would say zero, 255. 127, you know, and if I want to smooth that out, I need to have a lot more data points along the way to like make just really subtle movements. And what that means, if you're like finger banging all those little, you know, like oh, those little, like little, you know, just get it just right, which I've done, um, just it's just crazy. And then you mess it up, you lose your place, and then you're kind of back to it. One of the things about this board is it it can certainly work that way. You can you can dead simple just send a position information to it, but you, but you can also tell it. Um, you can tell it's speed. So you can say, I want to go from here, from this point to this point, I want you to do it in about this many milliseconds. It has a little complexity to it, so you can start with exactly what we're talking about here, but then you can get some nice, and, and if you think about, one of the things that's, I mean, if you think about when, you, when you're trying to simulate being a robot, what, is it, what do you do? You, know, you, start, you start moving really stiff, but what you notice is you're, you're making hard stops. But if you think about how you turn your head or how an animal moves, or, it knows what, you know, your body knows where you're going to stop, and you start to slow down. You know, it's a nice, it's a nice slow ramp up, or it's quick, but it's smooth, and, you, and then you ramp down before you get to the end of your motion, unless you're punching or something. You, you know, and you, if you start to look at these things when you've stared at a, you know, a prop that doesn't look natural, for, and you start to think about all this stuff, this is, this is my favorite solution for that. You can really put some nice, and it doesn't take, you don't have to be a, you have to do a bunch of math. You just tell it, okay, let's try going from there to there, and let's try this, this speed. So this is a good board to start with. It doesn't make this part any more complicated, and it works directly with some of the software bits. But if you want, when you go to the next level, you can start to really get in there and send a little more information along with this and do speed. Or, uh, and it's got a few other things. It'll do that nice curve, so it can, it can do acceleration and deceleration as part of that as well. 
It was really nice. That's, that's pretty tricky to do and with just an Arduino, and you'll make yourself crazy trying to do it. So let's see. All right. I have no... By the way, I have no idea how this, how long this thing is. I don't know if I'm like six hours over or or thirty minutes. Okay. So um, so that's that's about it. I've got the demo. I'm going to show you uh, actually how that works. Um, but once you get to this point and you're doing this, here's a couple of thoughts that I've had on. Uh, some of these are things I'm trying to do, so I don't even know what the answers are. But um, but if you take this basic idea of playing a uh, an audio track back along with a set of movements, um, it's a pretty natural step to go to, okay, now I can, you think about making it a little more complicated, could I load those files, or it depends on the device you're using, maybe you've got them all loaded up, um, but could I, just like with uh, that little control board where I could play different sounds with different buttons, I could do the same thing but include the motion track. So now it's kind of like those, those things go together. So you start to get some interactivity with some of the props, right? Does that make sense? Some, something to think about. Um, I made myself crazy trying to do this with a couple of Arduinos to get them to actually handle the audio and the sequencing. So I was loading the files uh, onto an Arduino. I got this close, but it just kept having uh, issues. But it's still sort of my white whale. Um, this is what I'm trying, this is what I'm very interested in. It's kind of like the conversation that, that landed me in the hot seat is uh, we, we had met up and I was talking about um, uh, I really would love to have several props that are networked Wi-Fi ideally that um, that I could have a central machine that's sending the motion information out across the network and because I have a nice audio system that you know I don't want each one to be playing audio I can have that sort of and I love the idea of having them synchronized and it's kind of a simple idea. I mean, it didn't seem like that big of an ask, but it starts to get really complicated because um, you kind of need to know what time it is. Everything needs to know exactly what time it is, either, either, either actually what time it is to a really precise degree so that, so that the timings are not noticeable. Um, you know, or uh, there's, a, there's a few ways to think of it. This is actually a really, I started to research, this is a really tough problem. Uh, this is a... Uh, I mean, really smart people have tried to solve this problem of like, uh, you know, how do, how do two computers um, without the benefit of GPS uh, sort of figure, how does a network get, if you need really precise uh, time synchronization, this is like this huge problem and, and this is, you know, this is me. I, all I want to do is make something that dances in my front yard. I'm, I'm, reading, I'm reading PhD papers on how to do, you know. So, but um, but uh, there's a couple, couple of ways. So talking with some of these guys, they were like, "I oh, don't know. You can get you can get chips that might help you with that, like for nothing." And I was like, "Oh, I thought that was my blocker." So, so I should come to more meetings like this. Um, <coughs> yeah, yeah, but that has uh, that has some. Yes, it's certainly it's certainly one of the, one of the really options. Fine. Yep, yep. There's there's it's it, it's very it's very so interesting. The reason I don't like RF is, is, is the same reason I really, I, I would like to find a simpler solution, but um, RF makes me nervous in the environment, you know, just... Don't forget Wi-Fi. Well, but my, like a homegrown version that I'm responsible, I mean, like Wi-Fi, I don't have to worry about it, it's a stack, but you're, you're right. I mean, and networking, hard networking is an option too, but it, anyway, I mean, I have not come to a conclusion, but you're, you're right, that, that, there's... I mean, there's, no, 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 it's, this has kept me up at night. And then, and then, of course, I'm like, why am I worried about, it? you know. Yeah, I think it's only like 215 days, something like that. Do you like how he plays off like he doesn't know exactly? Yeah. I'm sure I don't know what you're talking about. Um, this is really interesting. This is something I just, I just found. So uh, DMX, if you don't know what DMX is, um, you don't. Ha you certainly don't need to. But uh, but DMX is the protocol that uh, that is used to control stage lighting, and uh, that sounds expensive, and it is. But there's actually uh, there's actually entry level stuff. So if I'm like a if I'm like a weekend DJ, so there's a there's a whole set of stuff that's sort of targeting, you know, sort of sort of part time DJ kind of stuff. So you can get some kind of cool stuff that's, you know, r reasonably priced. And then you start to get into some really interesting Arduino projects about controlling DMX. So DMX, it's a, it's a daisy chain 
up. So, th so each device is connected to the other, and they're addressable. So you can blast uh, fairly straight, in a fairly straightforward manner. You can send, like, hey, you like, you know, and, and then the structure of DMX, each uh, device, whether it's a light or whatever, has a set of channels. So it's actually the very same concept as what we were talking about, a little more complicated, but each device has an address and some number of bytes of data that it uses to cr control the various functions. So it depends on how many functions a particular device has. Same exact idea. Um, it's, an old, it's, an old, it's an older technology, but it's really cool. So, so if, you can, if you can manage that, now you have all these things you can just plug in and start to control with your Arduino. It's an advanced project, but it's totally within reach. So something to think about. And OSC is kind of the more modern version of that. This is the same basic idea, but a much more, and it can control lots of different stuff, and could definitely, can definitely could carry the data for servo motion in a really, in a way that makes a lot of sense. Um, I've done some playing around with this, but it's just a really, you know, so there's a whole music industry out there building good stuff that um, it's total, total, totally uh, approachable on, on this platform. And there's even, uh, with, especially with the OSC, there's even uh, ready-made apps so you can, you can put together a set of switches and dials and kind of like a, a so, so really straightforward to actually control through your phone without having to write any mobile uh, applications, which is it's really cool. So anyway, let's, let's talk demo, shall we? Does anyone have any questions? No? Nobody ever has. You're going to give that thing to the main sequester, remember? Question. I imagine you're not driving these motors with the current that comes out of an Arduino. What goes in between? Um, no, I, I definitely am using mains power a lot of the time. So that's, uh, so that, so all of the cautionary tales that go along, go along with that. But a great, a great way a lot of this stuff is is not AC. It's AC, so I'm I'm typically bringing it, bringing it to DC. So a bench uh, before, if you're not comfortable with that, a bench uh, power supply is a fantastic investment. That's a that's a great way to do this without worrying about that. And then when you get a little more comfortable. But the other thing, so I buy a lot of power supplies. Um, uh, wall warts are great for this. I mean, a ton of that sort of stuff. All of the DC motors, uh, all of the wiper motors are 12 volts, so any 12 volt wall work will work just fine. There is no need to, there is no need to build your own uh, mains power. Um, I mean, and God, if you have been to any of these meetings, if I'm the first person to say that, that's a, you know, that's crazy. It, don't do that until you're really comfortable with it. So you can buy either the wall warts, which, which is fine, and either build a barrel jack onto your uh, boards or Whatever you're, and then, but but I also like the sort of caged power supplies. I'm, there's a better word for them, but but you can get those and you can get them every size imagine. You, you know they'll have one output. Sometimes they'll have two. You can typically get 12 volt and 5 volt, so that's perfect. You get a little. Um, it'll put out 12 volt, and as long as it's got enough uh, juice for whatever it is you're trying to run on the motor side, you now have 5 volts to power your Arduino board, um, 12 volts for your for your motors, and as long as that's matched. Uh, that's a great solution, and then you just have to be—you know—you just have to be careful. It's main power, you know. You're, so don't be dumb about that. But but that's that's that just takes a little, you know. Know your stuff before you <laughs> before you do that. You should be afraid of that, and, you know. But but once you know what you're doing, it's not it's not bad. I don't know. I'm sure there's I'm sure there is a standard disclaimer like don't use mains power unless you unless you're you know. But. Um, I, t I, t I um, especially, if, so I, I should say this, and especially since kids are going to be around a lot of the things that I'm doing, it's not just the power I'm worried about, it's, uh, it's, the, mo it's the mechanisms and stuff that could pinch, or, so we actually, um, so besides just the sort of things that you're talking about, and that's why I like the power supplies, because they have a lot of that safety stuff built in, so I, have to, I don't have to know how to do that well. I mean, even if I put a fuse on it, I'd be like, well, I'm pretty sure that's the right place to put the fuse. I mean, I'm just, you know, so, <laughs> so I, I, I don't go much further than uh, a ready-made power supply that has the outputs I need, and, uh, but I will cover those, and, I'll, and, I'll, and if something's got nasty pinching capability, I make sure we, uh, you know, keep people away from it, especially the kids, so, and me.
and keep keep me from getting injured. Uh, yeah, like I said, I can't say this enough. The kids in my neighborhood are way tougher than I am. I mean, they just walk up and go, I am not scared of any of this stuff. It's like, all right, give me the candy. All right, so no questions? No more questions? All right, so real quick. All right, this is, uh, this is something called VSA. And this software does exactly what we were talking about, right? It takes a audio, um, which you can maybe just, imp and this is an older piece of software, and it's completely jacked on my, res what, what, for whatever reason. My other machine at home, it looks beautiful. Uh, but you can just make out the waveform at the bottom. So <clears throat> the way it works, I created a channel for each one of the servos that are in this. And because I'm using this, Mini Maestro. This software happens to know, um, it supports a couple different protocols to talk to it, but one, that it, one, that, one that's really rich and lets you, know, lets you take advantage of all the stuff. And this software happens to understand that, so that was a super easy way to do this. Um, this software uh, is free for a demo, but you can't load and save files, so it's useless without buying it. It's about 80 bucks. It's a little much, um, but it's probably worth it because this is, this is by far the hardest part, trying to trying to match motion to a very precise point in the, in the audio, and you really, you really have to have that. But see this, this waveform here? These lines represent the values on the channels, so on the, each different channels. And if I had spent some time on it, I could make those different colors, so I would know which one was, was which. But you get the idea. Here, here are all the different transitions. So I've got a little bit of movement motion with the eyes. I got a little bit of tilt in the head just to sort of show that it's, it's all working. But one thing it'll do for me, and this is really powerful, is this waveform, it'll build, it's sort of guessing at what, the, what, the, uh, what are pretty good mouth, mouth motions based on the waveform. So you get this, and this is a great starting point. You'll hear, somewhere in here, you'll hear the breathing, uh, which is not Hal. It's uh, someone else in the background. And you might notice just a little bit of motion on the mouth when that's, when that's playing. That would be the kind of thing you would come back and go, OK, that was somebody else talking, or it was background noise, or it was uh, someone, you know, whatever, that you don't want it to react to. And you would just go flatten those peaks. And so you wouldn't get any motion there. And that's where you spend all your time. So you start with, you start with that, and then, you're just, then you just stare at the same prop for seven hours and just, and just until, you, until, you've, until you've got it just the way you want it. But you can really, if you do spend that time, you can really get some, some uh, pretty satisfying motion out of it. And I am just about done. Thank you all for hanging in there with me. Uh, no, no, um, not this one. This is this is a kit. It's really st sort of standard fare with the uh, with the ghouls. They use the, this particular one is actually a pirate skull that gets used over and over. It gets a kit and it gets used for stuff like this all over the place. So this is the end result. Here we go. It worked earlier. Maybe it'll work now. Thank you so much for having me. I am so delighted to come talk to you about all this stuff. I hope, uh, I hope you found some useful stuff in here. And uh, I think I got, I may have a screen here that has um, some resources. Uh, but I think you can share that. You'll, I'm sure you'll share that there. So, so for some of the stuff you saw here, where to buy it. And please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to tell you whatever I know for what it's worth. It'll be worth what you paid for it. So.